Good afternoon and welcome to SMU. Today I want to talk to you about a societal issue, about why sometimes fresh fruits and vegetables, they end up to the landfill before they even make it to the market. This is a phenomenon that went on very intensively till the end of 1990s. Millions of tons of fresh fruit and vegetables, they ended up purposely to the landfills around the farms directly by the farmers. This phenomenon stopped in the mid-2000s. We, we very rarely were seeing it again. But then recently, it reappeared. It started happening again. And lots of analysts were called in the news and, and in different podcasts, and they were trying to explain why this happened. And they said, ah, this is because of the upsetting of the market because of the COVID-19 crisis. But this doesn't really answer the question. Why does this happen? Why do we have to throw away fresh food before it makes it to the market? And actually, this is perfectly good food. These are fruits and vegetables that they are still pretty expensive out there in the market. It's not that their prices went so low, they became uh, pretty much worthless and we had to throw them away. We're talking about goods that on the one hand, we throw them to the landfill, and on the other hand, they end up in the market being in prices that they are not cheap. And moreover than that, how is it acceptable? People having, on one hand, food insecurity, and on the other hand, we are throwing away perfectly good food. How is this even acceptable in our society? In order to answer this question, we have to go back to economics. So economically, Agriculture exhibits some crucial differences in comparison to other forms of industrial production. So economics is different for agricultural products than non-agricultural products. Let's see how. The demand of agricultural products is peculiar. It's not really uh, the same with non-agricultural products. So consumers seem to not buy significantly higher quantities of agricultural products as their prices tend to decrease. So let's explain this with an example because all of us, we do it. The demand is all of us as consumers. So if the price of apples, let's say it's $3 a kilo, then I will buy three kilos a week. If the price goes down to $2, I will buy, let's say five kilos of apples because I like apples. I will consume a little more because now they're more affordable. If the price goes down to $1 per kilo, I would probably buy seven kilos, maybe eight kilos, but that's it. No matter how lower the price goes, I will not keep buying more and more apples. So if the price of apples becomes one cent per kilo, let's say, this doesn't mean that I will buy 1,500 kilos of, of apples, and you cannot really do what you would do with other goods. So if the price of iPhones, for example, would go down to $1 each, I would buy like a different iPhone every day. I would not even charge the thing anymore because I would buy just, just a new one. If the price of bicycles go down, I would buy like five every day. If the price of cars goes $1 per car, like everybody will buy lots of cars, but not with agriculture products. So the demand of agriculture products is a little bit strange. The supply also is very unusual. And this is because production from year to year varies significantly, but not because of human factors, mainly because of random factors. Sometimes you have a good year, and then in this case, you have a lot of production. Sometimes the year is bad, maybe because of the weather is bad, maybe because of the weeds, but sometimes farmers say it was a bad year and production is low. So you have production to go up and down in a different way than industrial products. So for example, if an industrial product start become really popular with, with people, then the producers can actually turn on the production of this product, hire more workers, uh, have them work over time and everything, and this will actually work so that production will be higher. But you cannot do the same if you produce, let's say, uh, oranges. If you produce oranges, then you cannot go to the orange tree and just turn on the knob and maximize production for this year. Okay, so production fluctuates, but fluctuates randomly, not controllably. 
And these two things, they actually contribute to the problem in a way that I will show you right now. So we are gonna go on with economics analysis like we do here at SMU. It's not difficult to follow. Fasten your seatbelts and follow me. So let's go. This is the demand of an industrial product, not an agricultural product. The demand of an industrial product, we expect that as every demand, as you increase the price, quantity will go down. That's why this line goes down like that. And then this is the supply because exactly the reverse happens with the producers. The producers want to supply more as the price goes up and that's why this curve goes upwards. Now we know that the equilibrium in this market, the price and the quantity will uh, come from the intersection of these two curves. There you go. So this is the intersection at point A. And this gives me a price of $5 and a quantity of 10 units of this non-agriculture product, some, let's say, industrial product. All right, so let's come now to the, I want you to do the mental exercise and I want you to try to get into the shoes of the producer. So from now on, you are a producer of this product. All right, if you're the producer, what you care for how much money you make? So uh, what you make here is $5 per unit and you're selling 10 units. So your revenue is going to be $5 per unit times 10 units. This will give you $50. You're not gonna be wealthy, but still it's pretty okay. Now let's assume that I'm going to take this supply and this product will become, let's say, more uh, easy to, to produce or for some reason, we will have producing more of this product uh, next year. So let's see what happens. So I'm gonna take this supply curve here and I'm gonna try to, to put it somewhere there. And then this means that I'm going to go to point B now as my equilibrium. And from what I see, this is uh, mixed news because my price will go down to four, but my quantity goes up. I'm losing money because the price goes down, but I'm getting money from selling more. Which one of the two is going to, to dominate here? So let's calculate the revenue after the increase in supply. We will have $4 times 14 now, and this will give me a total revenue of 56. That's very sweet, that's not bad at all. Now I'm making $6 more, that's a 12% increase in my income. Not bad at all. All right, so now let's see what happens to agricultural products. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to take this supply curve and I'm gonna replicate it there. So this is pretty much the same, the same supply curve, but I made a different color because it's agricultural products. It has got to be green or something. Okay, so this is exactly the same, but now my demand is a little peculiar. It's what I was telling you before, look at that. So no matter how low the price is, I'm not gonna buy very high quantities of let's say apples for any reason, because uh, this is pretty much the point that, that I'm getting sick of apples. All right, so we see here that there is a very small responsiveness of quantity to price, just because this is an agricultural product and we get this uh, demand curve that is pretty like steep, it's almost vertical right there. Let's find the equilibrium, that's at point C. Again, I purposely made it so you will get $5 and 10 units. So you can calculate the revenue and see it's exactly the same. So these two guys, the farmer and the industrial producer, they start from the same point. But let's repeat exactly what happened before. I want to increase exactly the supply, exactly the same. So I'm gonna take it from here and put it there. And this will give me an equilibrium to point D now, where again, I have good and bad news. The good news is my, my quantity increases. The bad news is my price goes down. I hope that it's gonna be the same situation like before. Let's see, revenue after the increase in supply would be $3 per unit times 11 units. That's uh, 33, that's not good. That's not good at all. So we see here that the farmer is like, oh, this year we produced more, we can sell more. Oops, that's gonna make us poor. So by selling more, actually, you end up with less money in your pocket and that's not very good if you are 
a producer of agricultural products, a farmer. That's not very good at all. So what can be done? So I wanna keep this graph here. Let me just throw away everything else and let's take this from here and put it there. And now I want to ask the question, so what can be done? Okay, how can we get out of this situation? The first thing is produce no more than 10 or pretend that you produce no more than 10. Meaning like take everything above 10 that will, will, will make us lose money and in this case, destroy it so it will never make it to the market. That's one solution. Pretend that nothing happened. Okay, so we'll take perfectly good food and dump it because we don't want it to lose money. And that's a solution that works, but it's not the best one. There's a second solution, a very good solution. The government can buy the surplus at a fair price and donate it to those in need. So the government will take this uh, extra quantity like this, let's say this extra unit or maybe not, but let's assume this extra unit, uh, buy it at the price of five and then give it to the poor people. Okay, that's a, an excellent solution, but there is a very small problem with the solution. It doesn't work. We have tried several times in several countries, almost everywhere in the planet, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because it sends a wrong signal to the farmers, meaning that if the farmers know now that the price is constant, they don't wanna produce 11 anymore down here. The price is five, this is their supply. They are gonna want to produce a quantity here, let's say 15. So now, if you do this, you actually make the farmers to produce even more food that to begin with they could not sell. So you increase the surpluses if you do that. This actually will make more food to end up to the trash if you try to, to do this method. So it makes them produce even more in this case. So this solution doesn't work. Another solution that is a great solution is that the farmers can process these, uh, these quantities of surplus of fruit and vegetables. If you make more strawberries, for example, uh, put them in yogurt. If you make more, can, uh, more uh, tomatoes, make them canned soup. If you make more oranges, uh, juice them put them in a can or in a, in a box and, and export them somewhere else or put them in another market. This is an excellent solution. You process and you export. Okay, so this can actually create a market that was not there before and can bring a lot of profits, a lot of new positions of employment. It can actually bring growth to the economy. Uh, but again, uh, there are problems with that. And the problems are that uh, this requires time. If, for example, you understand in April that you have produced too many oranges, uh, you don't have time till May uh, to, to start an, an export network in one month. They, this is something that takes time. It takes huge amounts of investment. This is something that you cannot do on your own. It requires reorganization of production. A company that produces oranges for juicing is not producing the same type of oranges like the oranges that they are supposed to be in the market for eating. And it requires governmental support because you have these little farmers that they cannot by themselves and create an export and logistic international network on their own. These, are, these guys are farmers. So you need somebody to do a central organization to centrally organize them and create a common network for everybody. And the best candidate to do that is the government. And sometimes governments are not very good in doing that. Then finally, you need to know how to do it because these people are farmers. They just know how to grow oranges and apples and, and uh, vegetables. They do not know how to set up a multinational, multi-brand network with exports and logistics and transportation and all this. This will be extremely difficult. So again, this solution sounds amazing, but it takes time, it takes money, it takes organization, it takes support, it takes know-how, and this is not easy to do in a couple of months after you have a shock in the market. So what do we end up doing? Unfortunately, the best solution among all these 
the only viable solution, unfortunately, is to just throw away good food. Thank you very much.